Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are back with another Neurodiversity Stories. We do these every single Friday without fail to help spread more awareness around neurodiversity. Guys, it's been a, a, a fantastic response to these Neurodiversity Stories. We have had some incredible guests uh, joining us, all sharing their tips, techniques, their stories, all around kind of neurodiversity and what their take on is and how it's affected them. We are also always looking for more guests uh, to join us in the sense of um, as viewers. So we do really, really appreciate uh, you tuning in live and then watching the replay. So with that said, if you are tuning in, please let us know where you're tuning in from, who you are. Please feel free to, to share that. Throughout the, the talk today, we will be at, um, there's an opportunity for you to uh, ask any questions or com maybe comment on uh, some of the topics that we're talking about. So please feel free to use this as interactive as um as you you know you possibly can so as i said before we have uh, we've had a phenomenal amount of, of guests today without fail we have another incredible gentleman uh good friend uh, david anson who uh who i met um on the you know the power of linkedin uh, social media and been following his story and the things that he's been doing around your university and i'm absolutely thrilled uh, to, to have his time today to come and talk to me and and share his story with you guys so again a massive thank you to David for spending the time. Massive thank you to all the previous guests that have been on here. And I also want to say a massive thank you as well to our show sponsor, uh, Claro Software. Check this out. So guys, Claro Software uh, delivers assistive technology software for people with disabilities such, uh, such as print and reading difficulties like dyslexia to keep them achieving all they can. They are a phenomenal company. Um, they're, all their details are in the blurb. Uh, please do connect with them. They're a fantastic team uh, of people and they are doing incredible work uh, for people with neurodiversity and helping people with dyslexia. So please feel free uh, to connect with them. So guys, Bring you on to our uh, our next guest again. Please put in the comments who uh, who you are and where you're tuning in from. I know we have a vast amount of uh, different uh, you know people from Australia. People tuning in from Australia. You know, kind of, I think it's the middle of the night in some parts of Australia at the moment. Uh, Kenya, Argentina. I think we have someone from Brazil as well, and obviously the UK. So please feel free to 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 jump in the comments and let's know where you're coming from. So without fail, guys, I'm going to bring on uh, my my next guest for our new, your neurodiversity stories. It's David Anson, uh, and he's going to be sharing how playing, playing to your strengths can give you a better window of opportunity and how it has worked for David. David will also share uh, elements of, of his story, such as overcoming rejection and homelessness and explaining how perspective uh, perspective is useful when faced with obstacles. Incredible, incredible uh, chat. And I'm actually thrilled that you're going to be uh, spending some time with us. So, guys, I'm going to be bringing on David. Good morning, David. Get myself into the bowl. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as it position yourself into the, into the, into the goldfish bowl. <laughs> but it's a great introduction. It's great to be here with you this morning, uh, having the opportunity to chat about my story, but also to connect further with the community. Absolutely, David. Absolutely thrilled. Um, and thank you again. You know how busy you are and reaching out. Um, you know w when you reached out and said that you would like to come onto the stories, I was absolutely thrilled. So, so David, I, I know a little bit about you in the sense that you know I follow that you on LinkedIn. Um, I you know look at kind of the content that you're you're sharing and everything. It, it, it'd be fantastic um, if you could just give you know give the viewers a, a little bit about yourself um, and introduce yourself. That would be fantastic. Yeah, of course. So um, I've kind of been in the neurodiversity space probably for a couple of years now. Um, how I kind of introduced myself into it was setting up a professional network for neurodivergent professionals. Um, 
it kind of came from some thinking not long after my first autism diagnosis back when I was 27 and um, that I kind of began to kind of realize that some of the changes that we're going to need going forward kind of has to come from within the community itself opposed to just relying on um, others coming to help us it's almost like kind of like organic discussion um, and as I've kind of come into the neurodiversity field probably you know back in 2019 what's really kind of amazed me is that there's so many like-minded people out there who are doing exactly the same whether it's sharing their stories whether it's going out there and sorting out their own initiatives whether it's a case of just even having conversations with people and what I think that is really really helping with and I, it, it demonstrated with what you're doing here today is it's allowing people to get the confidence then to go out and actually make change um, and I think that's going to be a really key aspect going forward because um, unfortunately we're in a situation where we're living in a very kind of complex noisy world so the more we can do for ourselves in terms of, kind of empowering ourselves the better so that's kind of the stuff that I've kind of got involved with post my diagnosis. No, absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for sharing that, David. So, so just so uh, people know, in the sense of your, your diagnosis, what, what, when, what were you diagnosed and when were you, when, when, did, when were you diagnosed, if you don't mind sharing, David? Yeah, of course. So I was diagnosed in 2017 with autism, kind of the high functioning, the bar that I got. And that was following, I would say, many years of not knowing, knowing I had issues fitting in and knowing I had issues kind of moving on with my life and not being able to kind of identify what they were. So like a lot of people, you end up with a depression diagnosis or you end up kind of in a bit of a vicious circle looking for an answer. And it was just like a conversation that came from my family that kind of recognised I might be on the spectrum. And that was around Christmas 2016. So the minute they mentioned it to me, it was almost like a, a kind of a eureka moment, a kind of a clicking yeah. that happened that realised actually this is this is something that reflects who I am. So about three or four months after the, I kind of I found out I might be, I went to get a diagnosis privately, um, just purely because of a very long NHS waiting list, which I know is a huge, huge issue for a lot of people. Um, that. And that started my diagnosis journey um, back then. And then um, in um, like, well, last year, last March, uh, through the ADHD Foundation's uh, university clinic, I was able to get myself an ADHD diagnosis, um, which was also very useful. So it kind of almost brought the two halves together. Absolutely. And we always find, you know, I uh, found out I was dyslexic to the age of 36, a so quite late diagnosis, you know, and and then it was, the you know, dyslexia and ADHD. So there are some there are, you know, when when we look at research, we think you know, there are this this kind of it, like you said, it kind of puts the things together because sometimes it, it just doesn't just sit is, is one because the spectrum so so broad, I guess it, it can um, it, it can be elements of other things. And I think that's why it's very difficult, really, isn't it, to, to know exactly if there are traits of other things as well you're absolutely right and sometimes you come out of one diagnosis with more questions than you have answers and I was a little bit light after my autism diagnosis because you go through this assessment that starts touching all these different areas but then you start to automatically realize that it's kind of broadened than that so it's it's, it's only a discussion I've had in the professional community around how we diagnose and that's I know it's a totally different tangent but you do tend to find that one diagnosis then leads to another diagnosis so it's a really common experience yeah no absolutely so, so if you without kind of you know some people quite precious by giving giving away their age but what age were you when you um so it was 2016 so what how old were you when that that diagnosis so i was 27 when i got my autism diagnosis and 30 when i got my um adhd diagnosis so i'm 31 now um which in in medical terms i get keep told that's really late but as you point you point context most of the professionals i meet got diagnosed in the 30s 40s and 50s yeah so it still it still feels relatively young even though in medical terms pure medical terms it's still deemed as a late diagnosis do you think um, that that element, because, you know, I was very late in the diagnosis side of it, you know, in in the world of diagnosis, they, they say, you know, like you said, that, that that is a late diagnosis. Do you think that's because there's more awareness around that that's happened? Because I feel, you know, you know, what pushed you for the diagnosis? I know you mentioned it was, uh, you know, a conversation that you had, but there, there must have been some kind of traits or, you know, thinking that um, there, there was something a little bit, um, you know, you maybe thought, differently to, to other people like I did with with other people so what was that what was that kind of experience like if you don't, if you don't mind sharing no that's fine I mean when I was in university um, I remember being in it was my first year I was at law school when I was in my first year and we did a seminar looking at the Gary McKinnon case and I remember um, he got a diagnosis it was quite publicized at the time because he was about to be extradited to the United States and one of the offenses he put up was that he was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome and I remember reading about it back then thinking this is me but because I'd read about the Gary McKinnon case, I immediately just thought, I've got to bury this right deep down the side because the association at that time was wow. the outcome would be relatively negative. So I always had that sense of I might be different, but it just, because of, as you already pointed out, the lack of awareness and also the type of um, information that was out there, 
it didn't really really come up until it became a kind of a plausible conversation in my mid twenties. Gosh, that that so so your first kind of realization of the connectability of uh, thinking actually this is what I got is could be you know based on a kind of a negative term uh, and thinking well this isn't a good time to you know kind of announce it because the association would be possibly a, a, a negative one that that that's hard because the realization of it is 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 enough uh, you know I, I always remember how I was uh, you know I always knew there was a, a different way that I saw the world and different way I was kind of interacted but it was it was the um, um you know I, i've shared before this uh, uh, um, news broadcast and i think it was only something like eight minutes long because we know uh, six minutes long i know news broadcasts are very quick they need to just get the point in and move on to the next subject and it was a lady being interviewed at a floristry and they were talking about dyslexia and how she got diagnosed and why she started a floristry business she said i couldn't spell how the bouquets what the bouquets are but i can tell you from the colors and i can tell you from this the shapes so, and it was it was that moment must be that moment like you had david where that click moment where hang, hang on this you know i get it that's that's literally um you know how it was so how did you deal with that kind of in, inside you know that it must have been pretty tough well, I think at the time, I mean, being at law school and thinking I want to be a lawyer and go out there, it immediately it was it, it was tough, but it was almost like an automatic switch off because you don't want anything yeah. negative to affect you going into going into the world. And I understand, and I see that theme today with people who who have got a diagnosis but just won't disclose it to their employers or even to the wider family. But yeah, yeah. I do have some sort of stake in the world because of that genuine fear, and it's understandable. But I think where I've got to really is, I think two things. Number one, you're, now that I'm older and probably more mature and more settled in myself, I see it as now uh, a kind of not expressing my identity or not being genuine or honest to people. But also our, our understanding has changed. I mean, when I look back at my childhood, I'm still, I use the word relatively young, but and that's because of <laughs> all these different terms. But looking back, I went to the school in the noughties and the information out, out in the noughties, so this was school, stuff going to schools, the only real information was around for it was really Tourette's syndrome and ADHD. Yeah. So anything in between for a lot of schools wasn't really there the, the setup wasn't there the awareness wasn't there so in a, in, a, in a way I kind of look at it as although that was quite an unfortunate situation it's part of the trajectory of time it's just a nature of the times you live in and you kind of take the opportunities when they come yeah no absolutely I mean I was born in in you know I'm 44 I'm happy to, to diagnose my <laughs> diagnose I, I like I have to it's my age so I was born you know in the 70s and schooled in the 80s and in secondary school and inside of, and 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 I guess you know some of the stuff that I've shared on uh, you know um you know openly that that the educational system for me where I was at was uh definitely not too aware of uh neurodiversity you know dyslexia and I, and I guess it was to, you know it you know, thankfully, you know, even though there's so much more that needs to be done within the education educational system, that you know, and I think, and I've said this throughout every single show I've done this, you know, I think teaching is is one of the most commendable, hardest jobs um, that that they can have, and especially if you've got 30 children in the classroom, and then one, you know, there's a neurodiverse element to it, that can be, uh, you know, very tricky for for both parties. I think you've hit the nail on the head, and I think that's the challenge that a lot of uh, parents and teachers have. It's, you know, I, I don't, in my experience, looking back at my schooling, it's not that the teachers were insincere in their intentions, but you just rightly point out, teaching is a highly stressful profession. Yeah. And then on top of that, you've got to deal with the stigma and the lack of resourcing that might be available for somebody. So it almost enters into a battle, even though it, no one really wants it to be. So it's, yeah. it's a very difficult situation for a lot of parents, as you already point out. But, uh, you know, it, this is why I think there was so much of a reliance on things like resilience and grit and kind of the more blunt terms back in the 70s, 80s and 90s. You had to just you know, pull your bootstraps and get on with it because there was no alternative. There was no understanding of actually where we were and what we could do about it. So what um, which you bring on, you know, resilience and grit and strength. And, and that's, you know, there's something, I, you know, I really admire about, you know, yourself. And when you bring up those kind of topics, they, they evoke different emotions in me, you know, and I, and I, I really do, you know, a massive believer in, in, in elements of, you know, that, that mindfulness and, you know, that, that thought pattern and stuff. So, so what, what's kind of helped you then um, in, in, how did you kind of create that, um, that resilience and that strength? And because um, I know that, you know, you've mentioned a, a few kind of, situations where you know that, that that it's been very tricky and very you know t tough for you and obviously you've had to build up those resilience so how have you how have you how have you done that David if you don't mind sharing yeah no of course and I'm glad you kind of framed it that way because that's when when you say those words and I, I initially hear them I feel exactly the same and you know, if you some say if you say to someone you've got to develop more grit and resilience the first thing you're thinking of it's more like just pulling it bootstraps and getting on with it which is like torture and that's that's normally what would come to mind and I've kind of developed it without realizing I've developed it and I think even 
the way I would probably describe it is that sometimes a series of life events will happen. Uh, some people are kind of uh, more lucky than others. Some people are more unfortunate than others. Um, and what I kind of learned through that is the ability not necessarily to put myself in situations that have been unnecessarily harmful, but it's to be able to learn from lessons and be a bit introspective and not necessarily take the view that the world is necessarily set against you, but to look at the way in which you can interact and find other ways around the world. And I think that's a better understanding of something called about resilience and grit, because what I've learned, both from what I've, how I've kind of inadvertently applied it and also from what I've learned now, what it's more about, I think, is just an ability to find your way around problems and to try then and learn from what has gone wrong. So, if, like, for example, in any relationship or conversation, um, it's not 100% one way or the other. There's always an element of reciprocity. Yeah. No, yeah there's, I'm sorry if I can't pronounce it. But no, please always, don't. Yeah. No, please don't that. <laughs> it's, it's always an element of, you. even if you you have a diagnosis, there is still an element of control over your actions that you still have, and you still can look at the, the ways in which you input into situations. So what I kind of learned over the years was that I'm not necessarily as powerless. I may not understand myself, that's a journey you go on, but as you understand yourself more, you can understand what works for you, make cho sensible choices in that respect, and then find ways to try and mitigate or try and handle situations that might otherwise be difficult. So it's kind of like taking ownership. So it doesn't have to be quite blunt. It just needs to be quite, it, and in many ways, the more subtle you do it, the more effective it is. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And and would you say that you kind of, uh, you know, you, you you approach, I mean, we're all human at the end of the day and, you know, things affect us uh, and, and you know, there are, you know, we live in a very busy world. Uh, and I think, you you know, you mentioned at the very start, there's a lot of noise and there's a lot of things that, that's going on. You know, do, do you do you try and kind of approach things a little bit different to how you did maybe in the past? Absolutely. I mean, what I think the, the if I look kind of in the last five or so years, getting the diagnoses were really important because that power is knowledge. And it gives you an element, I think, which almost everyone that I know speaks, speaks about is that kind of self permission to accept. You don't have to keep trying, pushing against the the brick wall or pushing a boulder up a hill you can accept there are aspects of your personality or or who you are that are just inherently like that but it also gives you an opportunity to get responsibility and one, one of the things i really benefited from was i had um after my autism diagnosis i was referred to have cbt at the Morsey hospital okay. um, which was asd focused cbt it was an initiative when i was living in kent that they were doing and i had sessions there and that was really helpful in reframing situations and what i found through going through that was although there are definite challenges around us and we do experience them it's it, when we take control and responsibility in trying to deal with those challenges actually we become we, we automatically we almost are more able to develop ways to cope with it and participate better in society and have kind of a stake in it so it's not always it's not always one-sided so i think a lot of it is about reframing absolutely and 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 is there any kind of do you, you know i i try and practice um for my adhd uh, i i try and practice meditation you know i'm i feel like to try and um you know i put a few posts out i think on one of the social media platforms and about kind of sleep and how to kind of try and rest the mind and and i always find you know this in this digital world uh, as well and everything that's going on trying to calm that 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 mind, especially at the end of the day, can be, you know, really, really tough. And sometimes it's just exhaustion and then I just fall asleep. Or sometimes it's, you know, I have to kind of, you know, listen to music or I have to kind of get myself into that kind of that that zone. So I try meditation. I love meditation. I, I'm a big fan of meditation. Getting me to do the meditation is quite difficult because you have to be, I feel you have to be in a state of a certain mind to, to push yourself um, and not go off and do something else. Do you have kind of a, a certain, um, you know, things that you do that kind of help you have the, put those strategies in place? Yes, and I, I think it's a really good, a really good point you make of ADHD because it is the mind is always ticking over all the time and I've never, I've not quite achieved managing that. But what I would say really helps, say if I take the ADHD element of my brain, minimizing choice is actually quite important. So it helps kind of minimize the distractions and that kind of sense. So I'm a little more minimalistic these days, but that's because it helps me focus a bit better. I think it's also recognizing um, what's in your environment is really, really important. So if you're in situation, if you were in a situation where you're crewies and a lot of staff or it's very messy, naturally to anyone that will kind of affect the way you kind of think. And I think it's being able to listen to how you feel it's the hardest thing i think for neurodiverse people because one of the things a lot of us tend to report is this kind of disconnect between our bodies and our minds that just seems to happen quite naturally but whether that's kind of worth focusing on your posture whether that's maybe um kind of making sure you get things like 
sleep if possible. If you're just trying to get the basics right and listen to how you feel, and give yourself time to process. What I found those kind of strategies have meant mm -hmm. that I don't get overwhelmed. And if you don't get overwhelmed, naturally in any situation, you have more cognitive power and cognitive ability to process some of the more complex stuff that's going to come your way as part of living life. Wow, that's absolutely fantastic advice, David. Thank you so much for sharing that. The, the overwhelmed element, you know, if I take, um, you're absolutely right. If, you, if I take, say, meditation, for instance, I've already told you in, in that sense, I love meditation. I know it benefits me. I know it can kind of get me to switch off, put my phone down, stop answering to emails and everything else. But in my mind, I'm thinking, OK, am I going to be relaxed enough? Am, am, uh, am I going to have a distraction when I'm having the music playing or something else? Or am I going to have this and, and all this going on? And then, you know, you try and lie down and have, a, a you know, the moment to do the meditation. And then you've almost built up this this anxiety in the sense that it's not going to happen. So you, you're absolutely right. It's almost, I guess, knowing that, you know, the process and trying to eliminate some of the barrier. I mean, they're there. Don't get me wrong, but trying to eliminate some of those and make the process a little bit more easier. You're absolutely right. And I think by nature, I think we all tend to be overthinkers. Um, I don't think I've met a neurodiverse person that doesn't overthink <laughs> things. I mean, we all, I do it all the time. I can sit there with a decision and, and overthink it 20 times and then I'll argue with myself and it becomes like a self-defeating prophecy. You end up not doing it, but then being angry, you should have done something about it. Yeah. It's, it's just, a, it's a bizarre situation. I, I don't know how we can fix that, but what we can do, I think, is try and make sure that we don't fall into as many traps as that as possible. Um, I mean, this is where uh, some of the conversation that comes up and I've gone through it myself is, well, if I've got all these issues with trying to get things done, then surely there must be something inherently wrong with me, uh, the problems with the condition and that can bring you down too. But that's where having that kind of awareness and that ability to put things in place helps because the way, one of the ways I came to terms with accepting the conditions and some of the side you know, problems that come with it is that being human is kind of an existence that comes with pros and cons and this just happens to be our cons and in a way if you own it's a bit like um young talking about owning the shadow if you kind of know that there's a problem and you're trying to do something about it it's not going to then creep up on you or it's not going to be disastrous because you're doing you're doing something about a problem that's sitting in your yeah. life and then using it in a way to kind of work to your benefit absolutely yeah, that's really fast i just want to touch on uh, what another thing you said about limiting choices how do you find um shopping for instance so i'll, I'll give you uh, how uh, you know i, I shopping for me so as in food shopping is is so is so emotionally draining in the sense that i you know i got the excitement I, I walk into the supermarket grab the basket grab the trolley but it's it can be anything from 10 minutes up until about an hour hour and a half maybe two hours you know and and and, and you're walking around i mean i tend to have when i have a shopping list i tend to have the job of shopping list and if it's written down what the items that i need i will pick those items up as it's as it's mentioned on the actual shopping list rather than thinking you know someone would go and go right okay i need the fruit and veg i need this i need to that that so and sometimes you, you you're in a shop for so long you've got probably security guards looking at you thinking you're a, you know a little bit kind of what's what's going on um but but i always find the overwhelming element there's so many products there's so many um choices there's so many things and i just it's literally almost like it's just sort of uh, caving in i don't know if that's dyslexia i don't know if it's adhd it'd be interesting if anyone um you know feels free to comment and, and understands what it is if does any of that david does that ever affect you those kind of scenarios or you could have been describing me in an atypical <laughs> shop to be honest with you. <laughs> Any shop. <laughs> I, 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 food, I can food shop in particular, you're absolutely spot on. And it's I, I have I remember growing up as a child being told my mum to kind of not stand out as much because the security guards be looking at me thinking I'm and I do sometimes think because I'm indecisive, I move between the shop all the time. Yeah, yeah, but sometimes yeah, yeah. the security guards are, are tracking me and I think, oh my gosh, one day I'm gonna get arrested. There'll be nothing on me, I'll be acquitted, but the embarrassment It does it does, it does. You're absolutely spot. On. The answer to that is well, I have had to go to do completely online shopping in terms of food and get it delivered and have it listed. Because what would happen to me is when I was getting better around this, I would forget something and then I'll be back and then end up spending more money because I forget something else. Where, and this is the problem with ADHD. It's I've, almost everyone I know has difficulties with money issues, not because they're reckless, but because the brain's all over the place and you just end up repeating yourself or making the same type of mistakes, if you like. So yeah. for me, it's online shopping because it's a listed, it's condensed, it's predictable. I, I don't get the excitement from it. so. You know, I, I do lose out on that, but it yeah. does mean that at least I get what I need to, and money is better controlled when it comes to food shopping. No, that's a really, really great um, bit of advice. I mean, I can get kind of really hyper focus on something. So I, I'll, I'll share this with you. This, this, for this instance, I went out uh, to pick up some croissants this morning. That's that's simple. So, but because I was so focused on 
being able to purchase these croissants. I then went to the village. Uh, they didn't have it. went to another shop and I was walking in bakeries and I was looking and it was almost like my life depended on it. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't like, you know, it was croissants. We had plenty of other things, but because, you know, we suggested that's, you know, what we wanted. It was, it was that hyper-focus. It was, okay, so I'll go into this shop. They don't have any, go into this, go into this. And, and I guess that normality, we'd be like, okay, so they didn't have any, we'll have an alternative. But it was almost like I felt that there is, <laughs> there is no alternative to croissants. But it, it's, you know, we, without the joke said, it, it's almost that, that element, isn't it, where we just, we really kind of focus on something, um, you know, but I, I think I've shared a few posts on hyper-focus as well, and it, it, it can sometimes really kind of take over control. Have you found that? I, I, I can imagine exactly like you. I'd be going through ten shops to find the croissants. So you're absolutely right. It's, it's almost like the focus is on what would appear to be the most disruptive decision, but actually yes. that's a hyper focus. And I think you're right to frame it that way because that's the I suppose the gift and the challenge of having ADHD because hyper focus is a very very useful tool. But when getting to, when something like croissants or something that's really like very specific, it's it creates so many problems. Yeah, yeah, it does. And, and and I guess, you know, if we touch on that, the hyper focus element a little bit more, mm. you know, we put that into kind of the work environment. I can imagine, you know, in, in the job that you do, you know, it, it can really kind of take over in the, the element of, you know, you can be doing longer hours because you're thinking, you know, I want to perfect this. I want to make sure this is OK. I want to do this. And, and then suddenly, lo and behold, you've then worked, you know, long hours while sacrificing, you know, other things, other elements, parts of your life that you need to kind of manage as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's always been kind of a danger. I think what's this is where I think playing to your strengths becomes a really important part, because I think you're absolutely right. If you get something that you're good at or something that you feel that you are good at and build upon that competencies, you can you then start to kind of rely on a kind of like a built up knowledge. So the tendency to I found the tendency to maybe let some of those traits play out in my work less likely now because I'm just more confident in the work that I do. But yeah. the very thing you have of ADHD is sticking out things for long periods of time is not an easy thing to do. We like novelty. We tend to go off on tangents. We tend to do, do we like um, doing new things all the time. So it's almost like the very thing that will be good for us is the very thing that's hard to do. But just through life circumstances, in my case, I've ended up continuing my profession and going on to be able to do it. And um, for other people, it, it's very different. And when you're constantly moving and jumping around from career to career, it's very difficult to kind of establish those kind of skills and that kind of routine that, and that structure yeah. that we desperately need. No, you're absolutely. I just want to share Graham's um, uh, comment. Just um, Graham, Graham Huggins. But um, wow, that is the same. Uh, same when I go shopping, I have to take my daughter with me to keep uh, me sane and save the money. Thank you so much for for sharing that. Um, so, so with with regards to um, you know, you know your position within job, have you been? Uh, did, you know, I, I, from the retail sector, I've always kind of, uh, when I was in the retail and the corporate world, I, I did have lots of jobs when I was yeah, when I was younger, and then moved into retail and then started kind of progressing with, you know, a certain company. And then, then, but but even in that mind, I was always, whenever I was doing a role, I always wanted the next role. And it wasn't necessarily whether I wanted everything that came with that role, or even, you know, the bigger paycheck or anything. I think for me, when I look back on it, it was more of the kind of different responsibilities or something different to do. Um, so that progression was always, and I think I just got to a, a real kind of senior level where I was kind of not out of my depth, but it just, it, it was really, I mean, this was undiagnosed dyslexia in ADHD and it just got to a point where it became unenjoyable. It was more kind of board level and more kind of strategy rather than physical. Do, do, do you think that's, is that, that, that element is within us that we kind of want something new. We want to kind of either progress with the career with the same company or start something new or get new experiences. I think you're absolutely spot on. And the hardest thing to do is not to do that. And that's what I've had to learn to do. It's it's, it's almost like I've had to, after the conversation I've had with myself is, I know I have this condition, but if I let these elements take control to such an extent, then I'm going to end up in a vicious cycle. And it's, it's hard because I think you're absolutely right. Instinctively, you just want to progress or you want to move on because we're not, we're not designed necessarily to be in a situation, not easily designed necessarily to be in a situation where we're kind of stable. But sometimes stability is the right thing for us because it gives us an opportunity then to pace ourselves and then learn the lessons we need. So when we do, when those progression opportunities do happen, we're in a better position to do that. And I think that, from, in my experience, that required an element of negotiation with myself to recognize why that's important for me and why having that stability is actually quite quite, quite good and why a bit of patience can actually help. And then it's understanding that this urge to kind of progress and move on is going to rise right up because it's part of who I am and then when I do get it what I tend to do is take a step back and just kind of let it happen 
and then just try and talk to myself and negotiate myself. So it's almost like the way I've come across it a little bit is literally self-talk. It's not forcing yeah. yourself, it's negotiating of yourself, recognizing the two, if you like, the kind of, not Jekyll and Hyde's the word way around, but the, the two elements no. pulling along yeah. yourself. That's absolutely incredible. And, that's, and, and that takes some some doing in then sense. You know, while you, while you were speaking, I did have a kind of a, kind of a thought in the, in the sense of, you know, maybe the way that I was seeing the job is that, because um, there was a lot of things within the roles that I did that I struggled and I, I felt like I was, you know, going to be found out. So, you know, I knew I couldn't smell very well and I knew when I got stressed, words would move around and I would be, you know, and, and I guess it was that confidence level of thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be found out. So I always need to try and push maybe, maybe the next role. Uh, I won't have to do this element of the job and I'll do more of that job. But I did, so I didn't really kind of think about it too much. It was almost, I need to move quick before I get found out. So you always feel like you're being chased. Um, that, that element I can always remember. And, know, I re and I really, I really, um, I, I, I was thinking about it times in my early career when I did it, I was exactly in that fear of being found out. Um, and you become very defensive sometimes, or you become very kind of, yeah, driven to get out of a situation. It's almost like that fight or flight situation. And some neurodiverse colleagues I've worked with for my career have been quite similar. Um, either they've left their jobs early because they either feel that it's not working out for them or they're running from a, running from being found out. Or sometimes what ends up happening is that they, they, they don't know how to deal with the situation, so they end up kind of hiding. Um, and it's, I think you're right. I think it's that it's, it's the fear of inadequacy. It's the fear, it's the imposter syndrome kind of element. Yeah. Yeah. Which, which, which almost just, it, it feels incredibly overbearing, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I, I look back at some of the roles I've done in the jobs and, and being, you know, physically, you know, exhausted by the end of it. I mean, I, I remember putting myself through uh, some, some promotional, um, you know, when I was going for a store manager, I think it was, and I had to go for, away for a three day assessment. And then for three days, they were testing you with business plans, and meetings, in uh, interviews and in different scenarios and team building and everything else. And and by sort of day three, when we were all kind of, you know, debunking all the, the and probably not debunking, but, you know, given all the information out, I just remember just sitting there in, in and I just actually felt like my brain was on fire. It just felt so frazzled and so drained by it all. Uh, didn't get that promotion at the time, reapplied later and got it. But you know, it's having, like you said, having those strategies and understanding, checking in with yourself. You know, I was thinking, it, you know, why didn't I, you know, I, I I remember those feelings of beating myself up thinking, you know, metaphorically speaking, um, that I, you know, I was a failure. I failed and I, I couldn't do this. Why couldn't I do this? Why can't I just give the information out? But but you're absolutely right. It, it is checking in on yourself, isn't it? And understanding those things. It is. And I think the hardest, the hardest part of being neurodiverse now is it's not easy to be purely yourself in the workplace. It's a, it's a discussion that's rightly happening within the community around what do employers need to do. And certainly some employers are on that journey to try and find strategies and ways that will help. But for the vast majority of neurodiverse people trying to get in the workplace and stay in the workplace, you're almost certainly gonna come into conflict with something or other that will put you into an kind of an existential crisis almost, because you end up finding actually you're not sure you can do this, or you end up, as you right to say, having to kind of have a brick wall. From what you said, it sounds like, although that challenge was there, you still were able to make kind of progress. And I think this is the problem, keep, I think keeping work is our biggest challenge for that very reason. Um, yeah. And I, I, what, I'm, what I kind of feel is that the, the only way that I have found being able to do it is exactly what you say, it's almost like having to use the standard CBT tools to be able to almost, in a kind of a neurodiverse friendly way, to try and accept and negotiate the aspects of the world and the aspects of who I am that are gonna clash. And I've got to kind of almost compromise or agree with those so I can have a pathway to have a stake in the world. And sadly, a lot of neurodiverse professionals I've spoken to struggle with that because I think it is a really complicated answer. I don't think there's a one fits all um, answer for everyone. Yeah, I, I think if you if you think about it, when you're going for a you know a job anyway, there's there's probably you know there's certain uh, you know we look at the job spec and and we we kind of scan down. We go, okay, I've got that qualification. I've got this. I can do this, 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 and this. And then we almost kind of just sort of fizzle out the other bits, and we think, well, actually, I'll get by, or we don't give it much thought. And it's those bits that kind of catch us out in 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 the work environment. And when I say catch us out, I mean in the sense that we then think, oh my goodness, I can't do that, or so I'll try and hide that. And then ultimately, then it is a vicious circle, isn't it? It is. And I think in the workplace as well, uh, people tend to find out that there's probably more value in jack of all trades, people who can kind of almost do a hundred things that can tick a box and having maybe one person who's a hyper specialist in two or three major things. And it's the way the workplace is, is you're more, you're expected to be more rounded these days than you are necessarily to be kind of more 
kind of specialists. And that's exactly where we fall into that trap. Because if you, yeah. because the difficulty we have is being able to, you know, try and show that. And the, the way that jobs are at the moment, it's difficult to see how that will change immediately unless you do something like going self-employed, which I know a lot of neurodiverse people do. They go out and freelance as a way of controlling that kind of relationship. Yeah. Um, and it's also difficult for us as well, because I think we like structure. We like clarity. We like the idea of having things that kind of come together. And a lot of the, some, the frustration, I think, just life as it is, it isn't like that. And I, it's hard. That's where we hit our barriers quite hard. You, you, do you know what, David? You hit the nail, literally goosebumps. It, when you say, you know, I, I'm self-employed, you know, I freelance, uh, you know, work out, um, and, and, you know, I've been in the corporate and that. But I still love I I love structure and then I fight against some form of structure as well so it's very you know in the nicest possible way so that that is a double-edged sword because sometimes I think to myself well it'd be great to be in at a certain time and have this and then someone telling me you know what needs to be done and then on the other side I'm thinking well my creative mind I can't do these elements so that is in itself is a is a battle so I, I you know I can completely um you know relate to to some of those things that you said no absolutely I mean I it's it's I don't know. The problem is the battle is almost like it. How I would probably, how I've reasoned of it is the battle is inevitable. It's just that we just have to decide. It's almost there's there are some people who kind of use the analogy of like the Jedi analogy of kind of like the the dark and the light side. I think that's probably oversimplistic because life is so complicated. But I think it's just being able. That's why being in touch with your feelings is quite important and having that ability to take time and process because you're never going to have the answers to all the questions that are going to be in conflict all the time. I agree. And some, there are some people that I think genuinely wouldn't would will not do well in structured paid employment. That being freelance, that having that kind of control is positive for them, which is where no playing to your strengths is really important. So it's it's almost like it's a person centric answer. It's a highly individualistic answer, but, and people don't have the support and the, the tools to make those decisions sometimes. Yeah, no, absolutely. I'm just going to bring in a couple of um, people's uh, comments if you don't mind, David. Yeah, um, Got Graham Huggins, he's put, uh, yes, I have to tell myself to slow down and stop sometimes as I'm always looking forward, but I, I know I need stability. It's happening now, but I'm managing better these days and taking steps, not just jumping. I always wanting to learn and helping though. Now, um, I, I know Graham um, really well and he's an incredible individual and doing, he, uh, I don't think people realize how much work he's actually doing behind the scenes, um, you know, for good and help and support. So thank you for sharing that um, with, with us, Graham. I'm just going to share... Um, Ruth, Ruth Fenton, she says, I have a portfolio career, vet, nurse, business consultants, uh, solicitor, managing law firms, and tend to get bored easily. I'm always chasing the next goal. I'm still looking for a role where I'm using all of my skills to their full potential and feel fulfilled, and where people actually let me thrive at what I'm good at, e.g. strategy, problem solving, and being creative. Thank you for sharing um, that, that with us, Ruth. And, and, it, and it is, I guess, it, would you say there is an element? I mean, it's, it's human, I guess, that, you know, to kind of still be searching for things in, in those sides. But I guess from a neurodiverse perspective, I, I don't know if it just feels, you know, like it kind of emphasizes it more, um, you know, w within those, uh, those boundaries. But we're more sensitive, I think. Uh, I think other people feel it because I, when you speak to other people who are in the workplace or just more generally out there, they feel that it's not that there's a, it's not that they feel differently. It's just that we feel it more intensely. I think so. It's harder for us in that situation to maybe put up and shut up, which is not really the right way to do it. But that's sometimes what people just kind of do it because it's you know they're paying their mortgage or they you know there's a lot of facts in their lives and they kind of balance it out differently. But we. Our focus is very different. We kind of want to feel, I think we ultimately want to feel like what we're doing makes a difference, has a tangible impact, that there is a, you know, there isn't there is an outcome that you can see. Um, and in some jobs there is, and in some jobs there isn't. And it's a bit of a lottery as to what type of job or what type of opportunity you end up being in. Um, and then life, sometimes that comes with other problems that you have to kind of combine. Um, and that's, I think that's the, the tricky part. That's the trickiest part of it. Um, because I think we, it's, I don't think we're idealistic. I think it's just, we're probably very genuine people. I think because we're sensitive and quite genuine, we do just want to do something that has value and adds value to people's lives. Do you think that absolute spot on? Uh, absolute spot. On. Thank you so much. I can completely relate to this so 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 much. Do you think? You know, I remember reading a few articles and they were saying. Um, I think the title was "What What Jobs Are Good for Dyslexics" or something like this. And it was. Um, I mean. I don't know. In, in one aspect, I think in that that's great that we can kind of think, you know, if you have dyslexia or neurodiversity, then there's certain jobs that you would thrive in, certain jobs that you might not. But is there, I mean, I'm just throwing this out there, but, and then on the other side of thinking on a category element of it, thinking, well, surely there should be a 
um, a blank canvas for you know to do all all types of jobs. But I guess it's you know it, it, I, maybe it's a survey they've done and they said well analytically that's what you know what we can we see you would play your, your strength for. Do you, you, do you have a thought on that, David? You don't don't it, I just throw that out there. So don't it's, worry. No, it's, I'm, glad, I'm really glad you said that because I've had this. Uh, I had this kind of after my diagnosis. I went through this kind of existential. I'm in the wrong job. What shall I do? And I did exactly the same. I looked through what jobs were good for this diagnosis. I had a look. What shall I retrain? And I couldn't fit myself into a job. So I so I ended up falling back into what I did, and that's why I'm still in an internal audit. And it's worked out better because you end up I ended up being in the place I should have been in. So that's kind of how it worked out. But I've met so many different neurodiverse neurodivergent professionals in so many diverse different careers. And they're, they're good at what they do. And it got me thinking that actually boxing is the very thing we shouldn't be doing. It's, it's harder for somebody who might be looking for an answer to, to kind of put a diagnosis to a career. Yeah. But most, what well, we have enormous versatility. I mean, you've got people in, who've got autism who work very good in hospitality. You've got people who've got ADHD who work very successfully in accounting. It's quite astonishing how you can have all these different um, conditions in different situations. It's just, I think our adaptability is, is something that's quite amazing. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, I, I share those thoughts, you know, um, 100%. The, the, <clears throat> when we, when we think, I mean, if I was, you know, I'm quite a creative person in the sense I, I love, you know, uh, marketing, I love videography, I love, uh, you know, photography, I'm very creative. But if I wasn't, and then I looked at maybe, you know, jobs that a dyslexic person should have, uh, you know, should should go for it. Creativity is one of them. It's, but it's it's actually you know the the you know I, I can't quote which reference I've sought it from, but it literally is one of the you know the top ones. It was you know creativity. But then you know I've I've also met people with dyslexia that are, you know are you know still kind of statistic based. You know they're not massively um, they they love the you know they love arts and things, but they're not creative. So then, like I said, that boxing element of thinking, oh my goodness, okay, so. Do I now need to leave that? Do I now need to become more creative? Do I need to have to do this? And and it can, I mean, I, I understand it's been put out there to, to really kind of help and support and it, it does massively. But but there is, like I said, there is that element of thinking, you know, it, 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 it muddies a little bit the questions, that, you know, the answers for you, I guess. You're right. And I think it, what it comes down to me is that we're not just a diagnosis. We're people with different backgrounds, different, you know, genes that come through us, different um, um, influences. And that's why you can't box them because you can. That's why it's so diverse. Because the, the, what what tends to happen, I think, is the conditions will affect you in relatively similar ways, but subtle differences in your environment or subtle differences in your experiences will change how that plays out. And that's where the research is really getting interesting because that's what it's looking at. It's looking at actually different cultures, different you know, different classes, all sorts of different ways in which it plays out. Because you can get people who are very successful and people who are struggling, but there could be a very subtle difference in in their lives that actually has that kind of differential outcome so um it just goes to show it's it will hold people there's so much that builds up that's not just our diagnosis yeah I, I think also as well the the expectation that I guess is put on you know I've had lots of conversations before around neurodiversity and dyslexia and and there's always this resemblance of you know I've said I you know I've been in business I've set a few businesses and I said oh well dyslexic people are entrepreneurial they're uh you know look, look at Richard Branson I'm like well look at what a, you know an incredibly successful billionaire who's done this business you know that there's a few you know you know a few more steps for me to get to that kind of that level and I guess you know not just with dyslexia but within neurodiversity I, I think we we have there there is a big scale isn't there there's you know of, of successes that sometimes you get kind, kind of compared with and um th when we talk about the kind of the day-to-day -day things that we have to kind of deal with and we we you know we get through some of this is is unrelatable um is it you can aspire to it don't get me wrong but some of it can be a little bit un you know unrelatable well entrepreneurs successful entrepreneurs are probably like 0 0.0001 percent of all people born in the generation or in the country they are the extremes and most people sit in the middle or, or, or portion towards the bottom but they're useful examples and benchmarks for us to say to people look what can be achieved in yeah. spite of an obstacle so that, that i think like richard brand's example is really useful to explain that um but actually what we and i what i'm hope what I, I think we're both on the same page completely on this one is we need people almost to from ordinary backgrounds to talk about it because that's where the vast majority of people are and without clear role models or clear kind of people you can reference to i think what comes clear is you start to discount yourself if your reference point is richard branson well the, it, richard branson is the one in 500 million people who's going to be a successful entrepreneur he's, he's, the, he's the exception rather than the rule the, the rule is going to be people who are just out there getting all their lives and getting yeah getting on with it
Absolutely. David, we're, we're coming up to the end of the time and I, I haven't even um, touched on the, the, the stuff that uh, I wanted to kind of ask you, but it's been an absolutely incredible uh, discussion. If um, if people wanted to, to kind of reach out and connect with you, how, how, how would they do that? Uh, yeah, feel, uh, anyone send, feel free to send me a connection request or send me a message via LinkedIn. I'm happy to chat. Uh, and also I've got the Neurodivergent Professional Group. So uh, if you go into my profile and click on that, or um, anything linked to me, you can click on that and join as well. So yeah, no, I please feel free to reach out. I'm, I'm, I'm keen to connect with people, learn, which I'm always doing, and to hopefully we can find ways we can all work together. Absolutely. If you want to just touch on, so you've created the, the neurodiversity um, group. Is that that correct? Sorry. Yeah, so that's what I noticed. Tell a little bit about that, please. Yeah, so I set it up a couple of years ago with the aim of just getting people kind of together who are in the professions, who have a, who believe they've got a di they may have a diagnosis or have a diagnosis, and it just as a way of creating a space to see what people may want to do, share ideas, or even just find ways to connect people who otherwise wouldn't have been connected. And um, so it's predominantly a LinkedIn group, and people just post things on their areas so often. But it's also an opportunity for people to contact each other or to look what other people are doing to try and maybe look at what they can do to help uh, push things forward. Absolutely. And, and that, those resources there is, is, you know, so important for people to, you know, to be able to connect and, and, and reach out. And like I said, you know, sharing their their experiences and the, the stories and, and those sides of it. So, so uh, you know, fantastic work on, on creating that, uh, that side of it. David, um, I want to say a massive, massive thank you for taking the time out of today uh, to speak to me. I, I, I would love to, to, um, to have you back on, uh, on your diversity stories and, and talk more because um, I, I've, I love the fact, you know, what you've been able to share. I've, I've learned so much um, and, you know, I really do appreciate your, your time on this. It's been, it's been a pleasure. And yeah, I've been more than happy to come back. It's, I've really enjoyed the opportunity to have the discussions. And it's, I, I always find just conversations are, are the best way of communicating. I just find that's the way you can get ideas and search for ideas and find new things out. Absolutely. So, David, thank you so much indeed for, for joining your adversity stories. Um, I will put all of uh, David's details on uh, on the links and everything else. And um, if it's OK, I can share the, the, the link to the um, the neurodiversity network uh, that, that you've got, um, and please if, if, reach out for to you know to David. And if you do have any other questions, please pop them in the chat, and we'll we'll work our way through those. David, thank you so much, and uh, have an, an amazing rest of the day and a fantastic weekend. And I'll speak to you soon. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye. So guys, that was David. Absolute phenomenal, phenomenal chap. Um, he is doing phenomenal work uh, behind the scenes uh, around uh, neurodiversity. So please, please do reach out and, and connect with him. Um, guys, that is another neurodiversity stories uh, for uh, another week. We'll be back next Friday where we have another uh, incredible guest. Thank you so much again for, for taking part in joining this. Cut all your comments um, and questions really, really do help. Um, and feel free, if you are looking to, uh, to share your story in the sense of uh, having a conversation with me, then please do get in touch. Take care, guys. Have a fantastic uh, Friday and a brilliant weekend, and I'll see you soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.